very proud to welcome to the stage, Helmut Pastrick. Well, thank you for that <clears throat> introduction, Mo. I'm uh, very appreciative of that. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here to present the, the state of the economy and where it might be going in the coming, uh, coming year or so. Uh, Generally, the, uh, I'm going to present the sort of the macro external view of the economy, and then I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some local and regional economic uh, developments. Uh, but in general, the external and macro environment is uh, very positive uh, for 2018 and uh, very likely for, for 2019. We've gone through a difficult time uh, post-financial crisis, but uh, now the situation seems to have improved, and uh, the level of interest rates, uh, well, I'll be talking about Canadian dollar, and of course, uh, the performance of uh, economic growth and income growth in uh, some of the key markets that, uh, that would be important for the uh, Whistler uh, area. But in general, I'm positive for uh, 2018 and uh, for the economy and for, for the housing market. Certainly, there are a number of concerns out there, but uh, I think uh, we'll uh, sort of muddle through some of those concerns in general. But this first graph uh, shows you the state of the global economy, and we've seen a substantial pickup uh, over the course of the past 12 uh, plus months. Uh, we've had that uh, slowdown occur from about 2015 into 2016, and this indicator of economic activity shows a nice uh, upturn has developed and into 2018. And indeed, for the first time in, in uh, probably two or three years, the global economy is growing in a more synchronized state. That is to say that most of the major economies of the world are growing at the same time, growing at a faster pace. Uh, before, we, we had, the, uh, of course, the uh, slowdown. We had uh, oil prices uh, fall considerably. We had recessions in some parts of the global economy. Now, that has ended. And now, for the first time, we're seeing some synchronous growth. Uh, countries like Brazil, Russia, uh, South Africa are no longer in recession uh, and growing uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, of course, Europe stands out here and uh, that economy, uh, while not growing at a robust pace, it certainly has picked up. So that, that's good news for the uh, global economy. Uh, commodity prices have turned higher as we see in increasing in demand. Uh, so the energy price uh, graph shows you mainly uh, driven by oil prices. Uh, WTI was around $66 uh, or, or this week. Uh, forestry prices, lumber prices are up, uh, uh, and then of course on the metal side, copper, which is uh, one of the key uh, sort of economic signs of improved uh, e uh, e economic activity has uh, picked up as well. So uh, this is all uh, s indicators that are you know growing at the same pace, and uh, given that we have seen these improvements in, in demand ultimately. Uh, interest rates, now if you're a saver, interest rates have really been uh, going against you. Uh, this is a graph depicting 10-year uh, government uh, bond yields for selected uh, major economies, and uh, you've seen a steady decline in bond yields. In fact, it's been going on for 30 years. Uh, but lately, we've begun to see a uh, turnaround. So with the, ex with the economic growth picking up, uh, we're beginning to see uh, expectations that inflation is going to be picking up. Commodity prices, as I showed you earlier, have uh, begun to rise, and that's going to feed through to, into higher inflation over time. Uh, so, commodity, so bond deals have now begun to turn. And are, is this the end of the long-term you know, secular bull market? Probably, at least in the medium term. <clears throat> The U.S. economy has been growing at a very weak pace, and this is typical of what we have seen, not just in the U.S., but also in Europe and a couple of other major economies. Canada is not quite like this. This graph depicts the path of the U.S. economy coming out of each recession since the post-war era. So there have been 11 economic recessions, or cycles, if you will, uh, in the U.S. economy. Uh, and this, uh, each line shows you the path of recovery uh, from the bottom of, uh, of each recession. And the red line is the current economic expansion in the U.S. And look how weak it has been. And it's been the weakest, of course, because of the great financial crisis. The huge drop in the balance sheets of households, corporations, uh, tight credit market conditions, uh, those factors permeated the economy in a major way. And we're now beginning to come clear of that. So that red line is now the uh, tied for the second longest economic expansion in the US. And I predict it will exceed the green line. It will become the longest expansion on record. 
And there's a lot of pent-up demand in the U.S. economy, even though even after eight years. Uh, just look at the U.S. housing market and how the level of, uh, of housing sales, the level of housing construction uh, is still well below household formation rates. And so there's a lot of room to grow. So that, uh, you know, that economic expansion should be able to continue unless there is, of course, some crisis event. Uh, some policy mistake, uh, geopolitical, uh, something uh, that may come along to shock the, uh, the economy, as we saw in 08, 09. And of course, we can tr go back to other times. Uh, think of 1990, Gulf War I, oil prices quite, you know, double, triple, etc. So those kinds of events will uh, and, and do occur. It's just that they're unpredictable more often than not. Uh, as I said, inflation is beginning to pick up. <clears throat> it has been very low, and hence bond deals were, were low as well. But that, that's beginning to change. We're also beginning to see uh, not just commodity prices uh, uh, pick up uh, and will filter through through uh, goods and services, but also uh, we're going to see some uh, uh, wage pressures develop as well. <clears throat> uh, this is a graph depicting the U.S. economy, just uh, the current uh, performance. Uh, these are uh, quarterly uh, real GDP numbers. And the red line just smooths things out. And you can see that the slowdown that occurred in the U.S. economy in 2015 and 16, uh, mainly because of the energy uh, collapse, uh, oil prices down. Uh, U.S. is a significant oil producer these days, right? Shale oil has really changed the landscape. And the U.S. is actually beginning to export, believe it or not, oil, <clears throat> as well as gas, natural gas. Uh, so the, this is a depiction of just the growth rate, and that uh, goes back to the, uh, to the first, uh, the other graph I showed you on the path of the economy. So it's been a relatively moderate pace, and it has picked up somewhat uh, uh, lately. <clears throat> and the latest number was actually, uh, it came out Friday, which was a pretty good number, around 2.5% uh, uh, or so. In the U.S. economy, the labor market is, is tight. So unemployment rates are around 4%. And, but look at what's happening to wages. So they're finally beginning to see some faster wage growth. And that's about time, really. Uh, after eight years, uh, of course, unemployment uh, you know, was only coming down on a, on a you know, fairly modest uh, uh, pace. Uh, but now we're at the level where it's probably below what most economists would consider full employment levels. And uh, we're beginning to see, again, more wage pressures. And that's going to filter through into the price of goods and services, and hence uh, what, the, what does that mean for inflation and, of course, interest rates uh, going forward. So this is a, a, a table just depicting uh, some, some forecasts for the uh, global economy. Uh, I'm taking these from the IMF and from some consensus forecast reports. Uh, the top line is a world GDP, so you can see some pick up there. It's not a boom time. Uh, I don't want to leave that impression, but certainly it's improved uh, relative to where we were in 15 and, and 16. Uh, the U.S. Has pick, is going to pick up. Of course, the tax reform, in, in theory, will add some uh, uh, pick up to growth in 2018. And, uh, and also for other economies, uh, even Japan is showing some uh, more signs of uh, growth uh, and Europe as well. So, and of course the bottom line uh, is the emerging markets and developing economies and that's where uh, Russia, Brazil, uh, uh, China resides and so there's a substantial uh, more notable pickup uh, occurring there as well. So where are U.S. interest rates going? Well, based on uh, uh, what you saw for a very low unemployment rate, we've already seen, of course, the U.S. Federal, Re Federal Reserve, the central bank, begin to raise rates uh, in uh, late 2015, albeit at a gradual, more modest pace. Uh, this graph depicts uh, uh, expectations of a consensus forecasters uh, that where the uh, federal funds rate, uh, that's those of the red uh, line and the, and the red dots, uh, may be over the next couple of years. And uh, given that we have uh, uh, growth that's above potential, on low unemployment, uh, and uh, some signs of inflation picking up, uh, economists do expect uh, the central bank to raise rates uh, three times in 2018, uh, two in 2019. Uh, the blue line and blue dots are the 10-year uh, government uh, bond yields, and they're there too. We, we should see higher, uh, higher bond yields. So the whole yield curve uh, is going to shift up. And that's good news for savers and not so good for borrowers. 
Now the market in normalization phase. So we've had rates uh, near zero of, of uh, central bank uh, raising rates. Now this is really a, a normalization phase. So we've had rates uh, near zero uh, for what, almost eight years now. And that's certainly an abnormal economic situation uh, development. Uh, and what we're seeing now is that central bankers beginning to raise rates to normalize rates. So we want to become uh, raise rates to, to, to reach normal and normal would be around, for the Fed funds, right around 3%, plus or minus. So uh, at some point, and once we get beyond that, then we're into a real tightening phase, uh, and then we begin to see some quite negative impacts uh, on economic growth. But right now, rates are being raised because the economy is improving. Okay. So just turning to the U.S. quickly to the U.S. dollar, you can see the large the swings that occur over time. Uh, this is a trade-weighted index. <clears throat> of course, the U.S. The U.S. dollar is the basically the world's reserve currency. Uh, a lot of trade uh, uh, is priced in U.S. dollars, of course, commodities, among other things. But look at lately, uh, on the other side of the graph, the red line of the depreciation that has played out. Uh, it's down about 9, 10% over that time period. Uh, and it's still declining uh, as, of, uh, as of Friday. And so you ask yourself, why is that? The economy's picking up, interest rates are expected to rise. So what, why is the U.S. dollar depreciating? Normally you'd expect to see uh, appreciation under those uh, conditions or circumstances. Well, what happens, I think, is generally is that the growth expectations and actually performance have improved elsewhere. Because bear in mind, a currency is just a relative price, right? This is uh, the U.S. dollar relative to other currencies. So if those others are improving, uh, that seems to be uh, uh, what's pulling, uh, pulling down the U.S. dollar. But, you know, with those rate increases that are expected, we could potentially see, you know, maybe perhaps a, a bottoming here uh, play out. That wouldn't surprise. <clears throat> uh, just quickly turning to Canada. Uh, the same graph I showed you before the U.S. economy, this is the, the path of, uh, or the performance of the U.S., of uh, the Canadian economy on a quarterly basis. Uh, and we've basically been uh, very much following the U.S. Uh, the correlation between uh, the U.S. and Canada is very high and strong. And we're now, uh, you can see the red line, is we've been uh, increasing uh, at a faster pace uh, over the past uh, uh, two or, uh, well, past almost couple of years now. It's really about uh, oil prices. So, uh, as I mentioned, the global economy is beginning to grow in a more synchronized fashion. So is the Canadian economy. So Alberta is no longer in recession. Saskatchewan is no longer in recession. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about Newfoundland. Uh, but uh, all, other, so all nine of the, uh, of the uh, provinces are now growing at the, at the same time. And so that's uh, contributing to the uh, pickup in growth that we've seen uh, over the past uh, few quarters. <clears throat> and also the better employment numbers that we've seen as well. And so for, for Canada, the employment, uh, we've seen about almost 2% growth. Uh, and again, that's because uh, we've finally seen some growth, uh, employment growth in Alberta, Saskatchewan. And of course, in BC, we had almost 4% growth. Ontario had uh, a little over 1.5%. So we've had some, some good uh, job creation. The unemployment rate in Canada is, continues to drop. We're in, uh, in, the, in the low 6% range. So we're not quite as low as the U.S., but uh, over the next year or two, we, we will continue to uh, see lower unemployment rates. And, uh, and for Canada, get, becoming close to that full employment uh, level. Just quickly want to show that uh, the Bank of Canada considers uh, that it's, uh, the economy is operating at pretty well full capacity. So this particular graph shows you the path of real GDP. Uh, that's the blue line and a potential GDP. The difference is, is, those, is the green bars, okay? And you can see how the green bars in the last couple of quarters are practically zero. So that's one reason the rationale the bank has been using to raise rates. And of course, back in July, it raised a quarter point. In September, it raised a quarter point. Uh, just this uh, week or so, it raised another quarter point. And this is pro the, probably the main reason, uh, again, the, that we're beginning to see the turnaround in oil prices and the uh, economy operating close to full capacity. My, my forecast for the Canadian economy is that uh, we'll still see a, a decent growth, 2%, a uh, little bit higher this year, uh, next year around 2%. The Bank of Canada uh, sees growth a little bit weaker in 2019, but uh, I still think we're going to see something better than that. Uh, th these forecasts, quite frankly, could, uh, could be on the low side. It wouldn't surprise if 2018 came in, came in somewhat higher than uh, the Bank of Canada is expecting and most economic forecasters, including myself. <clears throat> So where are interest rates going in Canada? Uh, looking at the Bank of Canada policy rate, uh, that's the red line. 
Uh, and the uh, orange line there is my forecast. I do expect the Bank of Canada to raise uh, probably two more times this year. And then again in 2019, I'll go with another, uh, another two times. Uh, uh, so we'll be behind the U.S., but uh, also uh, generally, you know, uh, raising uh, rates to a more normal level. And for, again, for Canada, normal would be around 3% for the Bank of Canada policy rate. So, but also the 10-year uh, government of uh, bond yield will also be uh, rising. So the whole yield curve will be shifting up. And uh, at least initially, I expect the yield curve to steepen and then to begin to, to flatten uh, over the course of the next two to four years. <clears throat> Canadian dollar, that's always a, a difficult one to accurately predict. Uh, and again, this is just a relative price, the, the U.S.-Canada exchange rate. And you can see the, on the left-hand side uh, the annual numbers. And uh, it looks like the Canadian dollar has turned a corner, that we're beginning to see some, some better, better uh, increased numbers, some higher values. And uh, the red line are the, are the weekly numbers. And you can see that we have seen a, a pickup, albeit quite variable. And, and uh, when you follow the Canadian dollar, you can see a one cent swing in, 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 over the course of one day. So that's how volatile it can be. Uh, but in general, it seems to be uh, uh, appreciating. And uh, my expectation is that we'll, we'll see it generally hold uh, and, and probably an uh, inch higher, uh, given that oil prices are where they are and generally expected to remain over $60. Uh, and we will have somewhat uh, higher interest rates. I'll be uh, lagging behind the US. But uh, uh, I think that still sets the stage for the, an appreciation in the Canadian dollar, albeit not a, a sharp one. Of course, we have uh, one concern is NAFTA, and uh, they just completed the sixth round in Montreal, and I understand no significant progress, but there was some good feeling coming out of that meeting, uh, but really, uh, you know, it's uh, still going to be uh, an issue that uh, uh, will cause concern. In fact, the Bank of Canada has cited that, uh, you know, uh, the, if this uh, does deteriorate, uh, you know, quite frankly, you may have to hold off on those rates. Uh, if we do uh, see uh, a NAFTA withdrawal and negotiations fail, uh, then uh, there will be a hit to the Canadian dollar. There will be a, a reduction in expectations for growth, uh, investment spending, uh, and so we'll probably see a downgrade in economic uh, forecasts, and hence the Bank of Canada would likely uh, uh, hold off on, on uh, rate increases. So this one's a tough one to actually predict. Uh, you know, what will happen if there is no NAFTA, you know, U.S. withdrawals? Uh, uh, do we go back to the original Canada-U.S. free trade agreement of 1988? for example. Some think that might happen. Uh, or will we uh, just revert to uh, World Trade Organization most favored nation tariffs, uh, which aren't that high. Uh, they're for about 4% for Canada, 3% for the U.S., 7% for Mexico. Uh, the economic uh, analyses I've seen uh, trying to gauge the impact of, the, of a NAFTA withdrawal suggest that there will be a, a modest uh, uh, economic contraction or hit to the economy. Uh, not a contraction, but certainly a reduction in uh, economic output uh, uh, over, the, over the medium term uh, as a result of no NAFTA. Obviously, costs would rise. Uh, you know, we'd see a lower Canadian dollar. Uh, but we would see some higher, uh, higher consumer uh, price inflation as a result. <clears throat> uh, you know, the worst thing that could happen, of course, would be a trade war. Uh, that would be, uh, you have a much more negative impact than simply a NAFTA withdrawal. So a NAFTA withdrawal would be, have, has to say, modest impact, negative impacts, uh, but a trade war would, would, would really uh, have a quite, quite uh, more uh, substantial negative impacts. Uh, and the other trade irritant really on the uh, macro horizon is not just uh, uh, NAFTA, but it's Canada, it's the US China. And uh, there, we, we, you know, China being the second largest economy in the world, uh, by some measures the first, the largest. Uh, there we're seeing increasing, you know, uh, tensions develop. Uh, you know, there were just recently the U.S. slapped on tariffs, not just coming from uh, solar panels, not just from China, but from other countries, uh, tariff on washing machines, uh, or the, actually they raised tariffs on washing machines. There were, there were already tariffs, uh, and, uh, and the like. And uh, there are appar apparently is some tariffs coming for steel coming from China, alum aluminum from China, and so forth. So how will China react once uh, and if these... Uh, you know, uh, restrictions are put in place. So that, that could be potentially more damaging uh, to the global economy and hence to Canada. Just quickly to uh, turn to some economic indicators more relevant to uh, the Sea to Sky region, uh, tourist act, uh, traffic uh, to BC uh, from the US is at, at, at record high levels uh, from other countries. 
uh, non-US countries, that's the way the StatsCan uh, presents the data, uh, has also grown at a very substantial rate, in fact, growing faster than tourist traffic fr from the US. And a lot of that, at least to BC, is from, from Asian countries. Here we can see employment. So, of course, the sea to sky is uh, right next to the uh, large Metro Vancouver area economy. And as I said earlier, the uh, employment growth in uh, uh, in uh, Vancouver was about 3% or so. Uh, wages and salaries, so higher income growth is at the BC level. Uh, probably Metro would be at least equal to that, if not somewhat higher. So uh, very robust uh, economic conditions so have, have played out. Uh, take a look at business incorporations for your region, for Whistler. A sharp increase over the last couple of years. Uh, also for, for Squamish. <clears throat> so that's a good sign uh, that the local economy is growing. Room revenue. Uh, sort of another tourism indicator uh, for the Whistler uh, municipality and also for Squamish. Uh, these are annual numbers, uh, 12 months ending October, so that's uh, uh, a good sign that they were seeing uh, increases there. Just quickly turning to uh, uh, construction activity, and that's a substantial economic generator. Uh, jobs in the construction industry, uh, just the whole, uh, you know, multiplier impact of, of, uh, of housing construction is very substantial. Uh, here we see for Whistler the dollar value on, on the left-hand side and the number of dwelling units on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, so if you just quickly do the arithmetic, uh, uh, suggests that the average dollar value per unit is well over a million dollars. We can look the same for Squamish. <clears throat> Obviously not, not as expensive, uh, but also a nice upturn on the, a new construction. So obviously, clearly, that's in response to uh, improved housing market conditions. <clears throat> uh, this non-residential non side, of course, a lot of lumpy activity. Uh, we're talking here uh, commercial buildings, hotels, uh, uh, offices, uh, industrial. And we're talking also uh, in public institutional dwellings, schools, hospitals, etc. So a lot of project-specific, and when you drill down to a small area, you can see a lot of variability uh, occur. Uh, employment, uh, unemployment in your region. Uh, these are the EI counts uh, for, uh, for the Squamish district and for the rest of the Squamish Lillooet Regional District. So I, I could, wasn't on the, I'm not able to identify Whistler specifically, but notice the, uh, long, the uh, ongoing decline. So we're at uh, uh, pretty low levels, certainly for, for Squamish, and uh, suggests that the uh, labor market is tight. I know Whistler's always had challenges uh, to, to uh, satisfy its labor demand, and uh, these conditions only exacerbate that, that, that issue. <clears throat> One last uh, slide I'll uh, present here on information is from the census. This is 2016 census. And I want to make the point here that uh, Squamish has is, is really grown, uh, has its own, own sort of more growth dynamic. Uh, so these are from the uh, census, and it's the uh, uh, labor force that is uh, uh, commuting. Uh, labor force, so uh, and where they're going to, so it's the, their commuting destinations. So I'm comparing the 26, 2006 census to 2016, and uh, the, the employed labor force who works at a usual place, like I work at a usual place. Construction workers are uh, site specific, so they, they're not captured in this. They don't work at a usual place. So for uh, the top line number for the Squamish uh, area is, uh, you can see the growth in the people uh, in the employed uh, uh, labor force. And those who've worked within the same municipality, live and work within Squamish, uh, you can see there about 62% uh, in the 2016 census. Uh, those who worked within the Squamish region, Little Wet Regional District, but in a different municipality or, or census subdivision is the next uh, row. Uh, the one that I want to point to you is the one below that. Those who worked in a different census division. And so there, of course, with the improvement to, the, uh, to Highway 99, uh, no doubt, uh, I haven't drilled down, but no doubt the most of that increase, those 1,800 or so, a lot of that increase, would be, those were, would be working in Metro Vancouver. So you can see that uh, now 23% of those uh, employed uh, uh, work uh, live in Squamish, but work in the metro, probably the metro Vancouver area. So uh, that gives, uh, of course, uh, uh, highlights the importance of uh, transportation and uh, the network that uh, the linkages that occur as a result of improved uh, transportation linkages. So I'll just quickly summarize the, the global economy is on a good growth uh, swing. And uh, there's no recession on the horizon, at least not when you look at economic uh, internals. 
Uh, there's no excessive investment. Uh, there's no excessive spending. I'm, I'm referring to the global economy and some of the key, comp key uh, uh, large economies. Uh, so that on, that's, on that front, uh, we can't say that there, we don't see a recession any time in, you know, in the next three to six to nine months. Certainly a crisis event could occur, uh, geopolitical, that's possible, uh, but that's uh, something else again. But there are, we're in this phase now where we're beginning to see uh, somewhat higher inflation, more wages, and of course that means higher interest rates as well. <clears throat> and as I said, trade policy is probably one of the top risks, but also geopolitical. When you think of what's going on in North Korea, Middle East, South China Sea, and we, we can let go down the list. Any of one of those could blow up and, uh, and cause uh, obviously very negative shock to financial markets, to the economy, and, and then down we go <clears throat> into recession. Uh, for your region, uh, from what I can tell, I think, uh, of course, as long as that external environment is very positive, your region will do well. Uh, and the same with, of course, uh, would apply to uh, Vancouver and BC and Canada. We are a small economy and we're very much subject to those uh, external forces. So I think the tourism outlook will remain positive. Uh, you know, even, even if the uh, you know, Canadian dollar does appreciate some more, I don't think it'll be too damaging. Uh, I think it needs to be, you know, 90, 90 cents plus uh, near parity. Then you begin to see a much more negative impact uh, uh, from foreigners uh, in reaction to the higher dollar. Uh, so I think uh, we'll see uh, the Sea to Sky region perform uh, well uh, this year and probably next year. So up, up until we have those more negative external uh, uh, economic factors uh, materialize. So with that, I'll close. I think I've taken uh, good. And I can take, I have time for questions as well. Thoughts on energy futures, on energy pricing? Well, uh, I'm not an expert in energy, but from what I understand, uh, uh, we're going to see uh, oil WTI above the $60. It was 66 uh, this past week. Uh, and of course, markets have a way of incorporating uh, various news and overreacting as well. So it wouldn't surprise that at some point we see some, some reduction from 66. But, uh, you know, there are some uh, uh, supply issues out there that are negative. That, that means they uh, keep the pro oil, pro oil prices up. Uh, you know, you can look at, of course, you have the OPEC, non-OPEC agreement to hold back uh, production. Uh, you have problems in Libya, Nigeria, Venezuela on the supply side. Uh, so that's, that is uh, you know, an element. Plus you have demand. Demand is growing. Uh, demand continues to grow about a million, two million barrels a year. And where's that demand coming from? The emerging economies, China, India, so, you know, uh, etc. Uh, though that's where the demand growth is going, uh, is coming from. Uh, actually demand growth, oil demand growth is actually slowed. If you, in aggregate, uh, in Europe and in, in North America. Uh, but it's, 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 uh, the emerging markets have taken up the slack and continue to, to, to grow. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, the, on longer term supply, as I said, U.S. shale oil production is, has increased very significantly and will continue to increase. Uh, and longer term, there's a lot of shale in the world. A lot of shale uh, with the potential for to unlock that oil and natural gas resources. So one has to think that uh, maybe long term, you know, uh, uh, we'll, we'll see even lower oil prices on a real basis. Uh, but there certainly could be, uh, you know, I, I couldn't rule out another era uh, here when we have $100 oil. That's possible if we have, again, a geopolitical crisis uh, develop uh, where oil supply is really constrained. But uh, uh, yeah, so that's a bit long winded. <laughs> yes. Canadian personal debt is not above. Uh, it depends. Uh, it's not a red flag for me because uh, it's the, 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 the quality of that debt. Most of that debt, now that's 160, actually 167% of disposable household income, okay, uh, technically. And most of that debt is mortgage debt. And mortgage debt, the quality of mortgage debt has been inc steadily increasing. Why? Because of regulators. Since the financial crisis of 08, 09, we've seen the uh, federal regulator as well as the provincial regulators for credit unions tighten their criteria, increase their, 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 their um, uh, underwriting criteria, uh, their regulations, if you will, oversight on us. In fact, look at what uh, the uh, federal a regulator has done to uh, uh, uninsured mortgages. So now you have to stress test, right? You have to qualify at a five-year rate. 
as in, even if you're taking out a variable rate or a one-year rate. Uh, before that, a year ago in October of 16, uh, they did it to uh, all NH all insured mortgages, uh, you know, that were. Uh, Insured, now, insured mortgages, now uh, recently they did it to uninsured mortgages. So th there were a number of, of tightening steps that they've done over the, over the past year. So the quality of mortgage credit is, is probably the highest it's been on average. The, the last time I looked, uh, the, the average FICO score for an insured mortgage in Metro Vancouver and Toronto was above 750. If you remember, this, this scale is 300 to 900. Okay, so that's high quality of, of mortgage credit. And, and uh, high levels of debt would be a problem if it's bad debt, just like we saw in the U.S. with, with their subprime mortgages. That was bad debt, okay? Uh, so in Canada, we have good debt for the most part. Credit card debt, not so much. Uh, car loan, personal loan, there, there's some negatives out there for sure, but the majority of, of it is good debt. And as a result, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, the Canadian financial system is, is very sound, uh, and uh, what, what we should worry about is not so much the, the level of debt, but rather, are we going to have a recession? You know, and then we will see, of course, higher arrears and some defaults. Uh, that, that normal, but it won't, be, it won't be anything like we saw in the U.S., you know, in the subprime crisis. Nothing, nothing like that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Uh, what percentage of debt is good debt for the average household? It would be uh, pro about uh, 70, uh, 75%. Yes. Did, uh, it does. <laughs> well, we know there's a round seven <laughs> uh, in March. Uh, will it be extended? It's possible. Uh, if there is some headway, I presume that uh, you know uh, the, they would want to. Uh, you know, see it out, if you will, uh, to its natural conclusion, but you never know. Uh, you know, um, the president of the U.S. may become, uh, you know, uh, impatient and uh, try to make a point uh, and uh, withdraw. <laughs> uh, now, again, it's a six-month notice period, and there, again, as my slide showed you, there's, there's some uh, debate as to whether Congress needs to approve the, the final withdrawal, if you will. It's one thing to issue a notice, but it's another thing to actually sort of kill the bill, if you will. Uh, and so there's some debate as to whether the president has all, that complete authority or only partial authority. So that, that's another area, that, that issue that would have to play out. Yeah, way back there, yeah. Um, you talked about the sustainability of the housing or the current housing prices. Uh, yes, uh, again, the housing prices, uh, in my view, in, in, mo in most of the growing markets will continue to increase. Uh, given what we've seen uh, on the uh, regulatory side, the, the stress test that has just come into effect in January 1st, we'll probably see some slowdown. So instead of growing at 10, 20 percent, it'll grow at, you know, uh, something on the order of 5 to 15 percent kind of range, depending on what market you're in. Uh, what we have to worry about is uh, an external negative event that will pull down the economy, create high unemployment, uh, then the housing market will, will fall into recession. I've looked at every housing cycle in, in the post-war era in Canada and BC and the US, and I haven't found one instance where the housing market will fall into recession because of, of, of its own internals, if you will. It's always something external to the housing market that causes demand to drop. And that, that's what we have to watch out. That's, that's the risk, is a, a drop in demand. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're, we'll have to wrap up this session. Thank you, Helmet. Yeah. <laughs>